shoes on Sleep on that Cause I've got a plan You're beautiful You're beautiful You're beautiful It's true I saw your face In a crowded place And I don't know Good morning, you're now listening to Kingston Community Radio, airing on FM 92.5 and AM 920 WGHQ, Kingston, New York. This programming is brought to you by our listeners and corporate underwriters who are interested in presenting local community radio. The opinions expressed on this program do not represent those of PAML Broadcasting or Kingston Community Radio. Listeners are encouraged to send in $10 per month to help bring this program to you. Mail your contributions to Kingston Community Radio, Post Office Box 4364, Kingston, New York, 12402. And for more information or to donate Online, visit our website at mykcr.org. And good morning, this is Dan Gatiss, and thank you for tuning in, sharing the morning with us, being a part of our uh, right beginning of the uh, of the week, Monday, April 26th. We got a new name for this today, and uh, it's 37 degrees here in Uptown Kingston, and um, weather and forecast for Kingston and the surrounding areas. Uh, we've got uh, sunny Sunny skies all day today. It's a high of 58. Tonight, a few passing clouds. And uh, Tuesday, cloudy skies early then. Only partly cloudy later with a high of 67. Tuesday night, cloudy skies and a 25% chance of a possible rain shower. And we'll be right back after these messages. Starting your day with Kingston Community Radio on 920 WGHQ AM Kingston and 92.5 W223CR FM Kingston, New York. Magic 92.5. Every 17 minutes, make a wish makes the impossible possible. They tame dragons. They bring Saturn to Earth. They help superheroes save entire cities. They even make unicorns fly. All to give children the strength they need to fight their critical illnesses. Every wish takes muscle. Help us make sure every wish comes true. Join us at wish.org. The stigma of addiction is destroying lives across the country, preventing our loved ones from getting the help they need. We are Shatterproof, a national nonprofit dedicated to ending the stigma and devastation addiction causes families. We are changing laws, creating a community of support, and providing evidence-based resources for prevention, treatment, and recovery. Stigma shatters lives. Rise up against addiction now so another life isn't lost. Get involved at shatterproof.org slash rise up. Hi, this is Dina Roy from Hurley, and I support the Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. You're listening to KCR, Kingston Community Radio, WGHQ 920 on your AM dial, 92.5 FM, and streaming online at mykcr.org. Your call-in number to call in is 331-9255, and... Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com, groups KCR920. A lot of events and a lot of uh, hosts and guests are always uh, featured on our Facebook page. And let's get to the on-air studio with Tony Marmo and Dr. Ed Alio. Wonderful. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. Well, welcome to our new medical show here, Dr. Ed Alio. This is great. This is Tony Marmo. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate being here. Yeah, it's great. It's great having you. It's good. we're just going to be, uh, I think, a once a month show. Did you say we have a name for it, Dan? No, I said oh. I, I, I was, I was, I was. Uh, it's at a med- loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing for you. <laughs> yes, it is. But uh, I was at yeah. a loss for words because I realized, hey, we've got a new show going on, and we don't have a name well, for I mean, it. Well, I mean, it is. It is a medical theme. I was about to say net medical. Dr. Ella, right? Ed, uh, Ed has been in the community for a long time. We're going to find out his background and how he got to Kingston, but. Uh, Dr. Stamberg and Robin Baker uh, do a medical show, and 
uh, Lawrence thought and uh, Gene thought it would be a good idea to add another uh, uh, flavor of a medical show. Dr. Alio is a audiologist, uh, been around for a few years, Ed, right? I have been. <laughs> <laughs> so tell, let, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and uh, how did you get to Kingston and, you know, a little bit about your uh, specialty. Well, you know, I'm from Rochester, New York, oh, originally. I didn't know that. Western, yeah, Western I didn't think New I knew York that. State. Yeah, you got that little twang. Well, I don't think I had a twang. <laughs> I didn't think I had a twang. I thought I'm I lost kidding. all that. I'm only kidding. Uh, and, uh, you know, in Rochester, it's always overcast. So right. <laughs> when the sun's out, it's really unique. But I didn't know that Damn. when I was a kid. You know, I had never been west of Buffalo, New York when I was a kid. That's amazing. And I didn't get to New York City until I was like, 25, 26 years wow. old. Wow, wow, so Rochester yeah. was it for you. Yeah. A lot we were, of Italians in Rochester, by the way. Oh, a lot of Italians. Yeah, yeah, yeah Western yeah. New York State, Utica. Utica was Utica. sort of a hangout, yeah. What was a draw to that? I'm just curious from that, just a diversion of, we have two, you know, Marmo and Alio. This could be a medical, Italian medical show. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we could invent. <laughs> <laughs> we what was a draw? How do, how do the Italians, they bypassed... Uh, well, they came into Ellis Island, bypassed New York City, and went right up to uh, Utica, How'd yeah, that, or, Rochester, or Rochester. Rochester, yeah. Buffalo. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I know my relatives are also in New Jersey, mm. Morristown and places like that, oh, in Jersey City. And they came up, they migrated. So we had, we had uh, relationships or, or with family mm-hmm. in New Jersey, but we didn't see them. We didn't travel. Yeah, right, right, right. You were. <laughs> you know, I, and one of the things, this is people, it's hard for people to believe this, but, uh, you know, we had five people who drove in my house and we only had one car. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty That's, sad. Yeah, yeah. Dad and, probably and, got the, uh, well, he probably got the. You know, top billing, right? Yeah. Dad got of the top course, billing. of course. That's way it's, that's the way it worked. Yeah. And uh, and at one point, my um, mother's sister moved in with us, oh. with her three daughters. Oh Lord. And and her husband and her. There were ten of us. Oh my In gosh. one house. Oh my gosh. Ready for this? One bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Talk about quick showers or quick <laughs> baths or whatever you took. You know, and I can never remember a problem. Yeah. With the bathroom when I yeah. was a kid. Yeah, we lived together for seven years. Wow, yeah, That's it, was, it was pretty nice. Where in Italy are your family? This is just the Italian part of me coming out. Where in Italy is your there? Every, we're Sicilian. Oh, Sicilian. We're more than Italian. We <laughs> we're Sicilian from <laughs> Uber, Uber Italian. Yeah, Uber Italian. Yeah, yeah. not as in the car, uh, you know, pickup stuff. But uh, yeah, oh, Sicily. What part of Sicily? Palermo. Well, my mother's name was Palermo. So you there you go. That one. There you go. And uh, there my, you go. My grandfather was from Catanzaro. Okay. In the, in the hills of All right. Sicily. That's beautiful. I was just watching a movie about Sicily. It's an amazing Big country. Big time black hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Across the Nostra yeah. area. Not yeah. that my family was involved in that. No, 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 no. But that was the, uh, that was the place. Interesting. I didn't know. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time uh, through our Kingston Hospital affiliation, going back to the days of uh, Tony Trielzi, right? Right. Um, right? Good man. I, good, great guy. Great guy. Um, I started in 1980 at Kingston Hospital. What year did you start? 82. 82, so right after. Yeah. As an audiologist, and we were talking a little bit off air that um, you were the first audiologist to, go, to become on staff at Kingston right. Hospital. Right. Uh, and almost to this day, uh, I know you mentioned you're emeritus. No, I am. <laughs> Does yeah. that feel good? <laughs> well, it feels something. I don't know if it's good or not. I'll tell you what. It feels like reality. How's yeah. that? Yeah. It's yeah. the way it is. Yeah, right. I can remember when we started, you know, we used to sit in these uh, medical staff meetings, and two things I remember. One is that I was one of the youngest guys right. sitting there. But, but probably uh, the thing that stands out is all the physicians that were there, they were all very um, formal. Yeah, and their approach, and they all wear ties. Yeah, yeah. Everybody had oh, a yeah. tie on. That's true. And uh, Doctor Mosley or or Doctor Van Gasbeck or all of them. Know, yeah. all the, you know. And um, but it, and we had great meet meetings. It was very educational. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. A little bit of fireworks occasionally. Uh, yes. <laughs> We had certain physicians in there that did that. Like Dr. Masseri was one. He's not yeah. he's in Florida Yeah, now. Joe Masseri, right. He liked to he liked shake to it, up it up a little bit. You know, he, I remember he used to talk. He gave a lecture one time, and he kind of stunned the medical staff at the time. Um, not stunned them, but, but reminded them, I should say, that antibiotics aren't good for everybody all the time. And he went down this road talking about antibiotics and how you become antibiotic-resistant. 
and and then he kind of he kind of flavored the language a little bit, which <laughs> made them all sit back and take notice. <clears throat> so he That's was great. he was a, a yeah, he was a character, very bright, and he used to he used to do this kind of thing. You're going to see him. I think I got this right. Yeah. I don't want to talk out of turn. Yeah, uh, but uh, he, he's not around. Yeah, so that's okay. yeah. Uh, he would say, "Okay, I saw you. Here's your chart. Take it home. <laughs> Bring it back later. Take a look at it. <laughs> no, take it with you. Take it with you." <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard. I don't know how true uh, that is. Yeah, well, he was whatever. He's a trusting but, guy. But, can yeah. you imagine doing that today? Doing no, like forget that. it. No, that, that'll never happen today. Yeah. Unless you look online, everything's online. Yeah, everybody's got it now. Yeah, yeah. So, so you established an audiology practice. Um, and, and how tough was that in terms of, you know, it was kind of a new specialty, <coughs> right. much needed, still much needed. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, you in the, in the half hour medically, uh, and, and what advice you have for people. And I see you have some gadgets in the, in the studio, which is good. Um, well, um, I was the first audio, I was the only audiologist in about five counties. Wow. They had one in, one in, uh, um, uh, Dutchess County, and that was it. Mm. Nobody was above us. Nobody was in Sullivan. Wow. And um, I was on staff at uh, uh, Harris Community Hospital. Oh, and Monticello. Monticello. Land. Yeah. I was on staff at Vassar. Right. Northern Dutchess, maybe. Northern Dutchess, for sure. I had an office in Northern Dutchess. I was in King Benedictine. Yeah. How about uh, Green or Columbia? Where you? Well, I didn't. No, you I, go up north. I didn't go yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I went east and west. Yeah, got it. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was. You know, it's a lot of ears in five counties, right? <laughs> a lot of counties. It's a lot of counties. Even in Orange County, yeah, people times two. Must have. We had to. You people know, be, times you know, two. As you know, as a uh, if you're a, a medical physician, I'm a PhD. Right. So if you're a medical physician, you set up and you know. Right. But but in as a non medical person. Um, I mean, uh, not having a uh, MD, right? It, it took a lot longer to establish yourself. And credibility that so yeah, I had to, you yeah. Know, but it was it, earn your wings, kind of. It was good. I we were, I had offices. I had an office in the Benedictine. We saw a lot of dizzy patients. Right. You know, we saw. Uh, uh, I did a lot of testing of people, right. and uh, it was it was a great experience. Yeah. So you'd probably collaborate with the ear, nose, and throat yes. uh, physicians and, and neurologists. Neurologists, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many people uh, are walking around with hearing problems? You know, that maybe are undiagnosed or, uh, you know, what what's the you know the most commonly used words uh, between uh, partners, married couples? What'd you say, dear? <laughs> Is that, I don't know if that's selective hearing. It's and, selective. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but tinnitus, tinnitus, tinnitus is probably one of the most common. What's that? Tinnitus. 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 Yeah. That's, I, I, we can talk about that, too. Yeah. But let me just comment on selective hearing because um, it, uh, this will shock everybody who's listening, including you, Dan, uh, is that uh, there's no such thing as selective hearing. It doesn't exist unless you have a mental problem. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, right. uh, unless you need counseling in your family. Right. In other words, that's, that's, I'm just trying to be a, yeah, a, no, a no, that's sarcastic, good. but people really can't hear. So, but they hear different frequencies, if you will. So most guys, most people lose high-pitched tones first. So, and, and background noise affects high frequency m- covers it up. So people can't uh, always hear what's going on. And um, so when a wife speaks to a man, for example, her, she has a different, uh, tone. a different tone to her voice, and it's more difficult. Plus, you have to alert the person. If a guy has a hearing loss or a woman has a hearing loss, if you just start talking to him, and I can explain later how that works, they don't always hear you to start. They go, what? Mm-hmm. And 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 um, and they can't get it, and they chase conversations. They, you know, that's why people. If you see people who have hearing loss, sometimes they sit there and they don't they don't participate. Oh. Uh, so, and same thing with children. That's a good one too. Children, they go like he can hear. He hears my husband, or he hear, he hears me, but doesn't hear my husband. Well, that's a different problem. Mm-hmm. Children have low pitch hearing losses from stuffy ears, and if they have allergies or if they have problems with their ears um they also have problem with background noise right and and they can't always hear people with our voices low pitch so if you and they go well if i whisper to him he hears well guess what 
whispering is high frequency. <laughs> so they don't really yeah, tune sure. out. I mean, there, I mean, sure, there are some people who, you know, you don't, maybe sometimes you don't want to hear them. <laughs> An interesting <laughs> but, aspect of what you're saying, Dr. Uh, Elio, is that um, uh, if you get a person's attention, even if you have serious hearing loss, if you get the person's attention yeah. first, eye, ear, and then you've got the other senses to uh, tune in to, then they might have a better success in, in following what's going on, in following the conversation. That's, That's very, one. very, very, very astute. Yeah. Very good. It's, you, hear, you hear a couple ways, eyes, ears, intellect. You got to look at the person, you got to hear them or have help hearing, and you got to concentrate right. to hear. So but often, normal people do that. So hearing loss has to work harder. And Go oftentimes ahead. when we're having conversations, uh, the, the TV is on in the background, the radio, I mean, you know, some kind of music is on in the background. A lot of ambience, ambient noise yeah. that's, you know, kind of filling the room. And then your points are right on. Uh, Ed, your points are right on. I mean, that's, uh, I hope my uh, significant other is listening. <laughs> no, because I think, I think marrieds have, uh, have this issue more than, often than not. You know, the husband's in one room, the wife's in another room, the TV is on, something, you know, and you're trying to have a conversation. Just not a good formula. And, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with being deaf. It has to do with having a small hearing loss. Yes. You know, I mean, something that most people don't even know they have. Hearing is not something that people really focus on you know, when they can't hear so well, and they all deny they can't hear. Mm -hmm. So... You know, one person says you have selective hearing, the other person denies that they have a hearing loss. <laughs> That's an uphill battle <laughs> when you think about it. So yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, my son's in Thailand. He said he might listen. So I'll say that my son, uh, he... Uh, Is it, it in Thailand? It, it's a 12-hour difference, okay, 7 o'clock so, at night. Oh, so. so he... Um, uh, uh, he he was a, he's a gun guy. Okay. And he had a, a gun business here. Right, uh, right, right. Bullet guy in Tilson. And he did competitive shooting. Well, now he has a hearing loss. Yeah. Even though he wear earmuffs and earplugs, he has Still. a hearing loss. So I called him last night, and he said, and he answered, and he couldn't hear me. He hung up. He called back, and he says, okay, I have my hearing aids in now. Yeah. Now, how old is he, <clears throat> roughly? He's like in his late 40s. Late 40s, yeah. So, and <clears throat> so his hearing aids stream to his phone, so he can hear through his hearing aids. Via That's phone. amazing, the technology. So, we'll yeah. talk about technology, it's how it's tight. changed gigantically. Uh, but that's interesting. So, you know, uh, if you're in a per some kind of profession that generates a lot of noise, uh, you know, or, or your job has, you know, warehouse and it's some, some kind of or you're going, you're machinery going, going or manufacturing. You're going to have a hearing loss. Yeah, going to happen. All right? the construction guys have hearing loss. All the truck drivers have hearing loss. Yeah. All the guys who drive heavy equipment have hearing loss. How about musicians? They have hearing loss. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, how, not, how do they not, you know? Yeah. It's uh, so. Yeah, you know, all it takes is a period of time that, uh, you know, you were just using a room, for instance, uh, a rehearsal space that was just way too yeah. reflective, re reverberant, and you played loud, and uh, there you go. Yeah. That, so just a couple years of that guess, is enough. You know, uh, that the first step in this is, is, you know, trying to drop your vanity a little bit uh, or say, you know what, acknowledge the fact that you have a hearing loss. Right. <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? That does sound easy. <laughs> yeah. that's, the hard, that's the hardest part. Um, most people... Like I said, they don't recognize it. And they, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> if you were to poll a bunch of people and you said to them, you know, would you like to wear these glasses? And they go, that's pretty nice looking, you know. Yeah. Would you like to get a pair of hearing aids? I bet you the answer would be just the opposite. <laughs> there aren't many people well, looking the stigma, for hearing aids. Yeah, that's true. But the stigma of having them large and very, very, well, uh, very, very, very prominently there is one thing, but uh, the new technologies definitely are well, much, much this. smaller. Think about this, Dan. Um, look at the things that hang off of people's ears now. That's <laughs> true. They got all kinds of true. buds in their ears, and they're uh, bigger earbuds. than hearing. And they're bigger than hearing aids. Way yeah, bigger. That's true. And <laughs> I have one that I have a Bluetooth that goes in my ear and has a a, a microphone sticking out on the yeah. side of my face. Right. You know, and no, nobody thinks twice about it. But to <laughs> true. Put, to, but to put a hearing aid behind your ear and the hearing is pretty small, or or in your ear, nobody can even see it. Is uh, you know, mm -hmm. but it's 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 definitely has a um, a history 
you said stigma, history from the old days. Some people still think that hearing has wires <laughs> like a body aid, you know, exactly. attached to their chest. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how primitive yeah, these some people react to the it. history. Yeah, it. <clears throat> no, it's, uh, it's 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 amazing, you know. Um, geez, I just had a good question and it just escaped me. Isn't that terrible? Well, I, <laughs> before I got to Kingston, you know, uh, I was an academic, and um, am I proud of that? Yeah, I'm proud of that. Um, um, we're on youtube so be careful <laughs> i uh you know no i enjoyed teaching i taught for eight years in the university system and i like i like lecturing i lecture at yeah. the hospital to family practice and right I, i've lec- i've been lucky i've lectured probably many places around the country and and, and internationally yeah. yeah um so it's uh i have a, i have a i have another saying uh, i call them elioisms uh, you're an expert if you're 40 miles from home. Yeah, right. You know, when you're home, you're just the <laughs> yeah. Average, you're you know. just the average person that's there. So I and I've been really lucky that way. Yeah. And um, you know, so as an academic, I taught for for you know eight years, and then yeah. I went into private practice. Yeah. And, uh, Interesting. So I, I think um, we have uh, guests today um, uh, on the show. Uh, 7:30, Dr. Mark Tack, who's uh, infectious disease specialist, right. coming in. Uh, and then at 8 o'clock, uh, well, Dr. Tack is calling in. Uh, 8 o'clock, Dr. Ken Kircher, who's a dermatologist. Right, he's coming in. Coming in the studio which would be great. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, we can talk about certainly, you know, der- dermatology is like almost like hearing. It's like everybody's got some issues somewhere, yeah. right? Um, and then, well, this is the summer. The sun's coming out, and people right. want to go outside. So, right. you know, dermatology becomes an issue. Yeah, with, it's the biggest know, the, organ we've got. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so that's a good one. And then we're gonna we're gonna you know dig into um, some audiology. Uh, you know what? You know how has the uh, progression occurred over the years in terms of you know where when, when you first came to Kingston in 1982, you know what was on the market, what were the issues, and and here we are. Uh, a few years later, <laughs> and uh, what's it look like now? You know, uh, and and uh, you know, ha- has all the technology helped? Um, but we'll we'll uh, te- that's a teaser. That's a little teaser. We'll get we'll get into that. And and then I think we could also take calls, right? I mean, that's pretty typical for. Uh, As me- always, the, the, phone, the, the lines are open. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so. So what do you do in your spare time? Any, any, <laughs> is that too much of an open-ended question? <laughs> well, you know, um, for, I always say, you know, you need a diversion. Yeah. And, you know, I, I consider myself sort of a high energy person mm-hmm. and I like to be busy. I'm up at, you know, 5.30 in the morning. Yeah. I go to the gym except today. I yeah, you're in really good shape. He's in great, he's always been in amazing condition, yeah, physical I, thank condition. Thank you. And uh, so, you know, I, uh, I also uh, put together houses. I build houses. Okay. Um, All right. Mostly modulars. Okay. And, oh, interesting. Uh, you know, um, so that keeps me busy. Um, I right. have a number of them around. Big Kingston. call now for uh, for housing in this area, right? Yeah, but the problem with building a house right now is the lumber is so expensive. Yeah. You right. Know, right. To, but but it's not stopping people. Trust me. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I, I do that, and you yeah. know, I, I'm trying to travel more. I'm, um, I'm yeah. thinking about going on the road, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles Corralt, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. That's a great idea. Make sure you chronicle it. Make sure you have some figure out a way, like a maybe a cross country gig or. Yeah. Well, I don't great. know about chronicling it, but. <laughs> you know, I'll definitely. You might be having slow. too much fun, so you <laughs> might not chronicle. want to chronicle I'm, at all. Right, right, right. That's true. <laughs> I'm going to try to get off of the interstates a little bit, and you know, yeah. go other places and travel. Yeah. I mean, to the into the yeah. Uh, so it, off the know, beaten track, so to speak. So I, I do that, and uh, how'd you, know. you get into the housing f- field? That's interesting. I always like real estate. Yeah, I like real estate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and since forever, it took me it took me years and years from Ed Elio's point of view right. of how to do it. Right. And um, uh, you know, and a lot of it I learned from my patients. Not only did I learn a little bit about you know how to survive financially from patients. But I also learn audiology from patients mm-hmm. by listening to what they say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They teach you about how to solve their problem yeah. if you listen to them. 
Yeah, interesting. Um, and you know, so, and I, I've written a, a couple articles. Uh, I, I'm a pretty basic guy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I've written a couple articles on uh, uh, how to get people to um, uh, to hear better. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wrote one article on and this sounds this is pretty 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 basic. How to turn a hearing aid on? Okay, does that sound pretty silly or what? But it's it's silly only in 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 getting your attention. Because what engineers have done is they've always put together their their all algorithms and their technology based on what they see on a screen. Mm -hmm. But you don't hear, you know, hear you, you, we don't hear out, you know, we hear inside our head. We don't hear in, out there. Mm -hmm. So they're turning a hearing aid on, if you can visualize this a little bit, and they're looking at a screen like you would do, Dan, you know, monitoring what's going on. And... Uh, and, and they think that it looks pretty good. The waves are good, everything looks really good. But inside someone's head is different. Right. So you hear two ways, and then I'll stop at this. You hear front, inside, if you plug your ears, and you just go one, two, three, four, you'll hear your voice inside your head. That's through bone, goes right. through your head. The other way, it comes out of your mouth, goes around, and goes in your ear. Right. That's by air. So the two of them have to be the same. Well, when you are monitoring something, like turning a hearing aid on, you're listening out there. You're not listening inside your head. Mm -hmm. you're, you're hearing in your head, but you're you're yeah. monitoring what's going on. So they they tend to make the hearing aid too loud, even no matter the technology. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. That's kind of no, that's, uh, weird. That's but. a good thing. I, I, and the other thing that always amazes me is when we hear our own voice. You know, maybe for the first time, or you you know you hear it right as the doctor is saying it's coming out, going back in. But when you listen to it on a recording, it's like wow. Do I sound like that? That's different because that's you hear yourself inside your head and yeah. outside. Now you're only hearing yourself outside, outside. your head. Yeah, yeah, that's it's called air by yeah. air, and so you're missing that that tone. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I know. Everybody says it. I, I know. I hate it listening happens, to myself. Yeah, it happens every time. <laughs> you know. As soon as you've had your uh, voice recorded. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and singers go through that a lot too. Yeah, and there's absolutely. a lot of training with 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 singing. Yeah, to yeah. Uh, to uh, acknowledge that. Well, this is going to be great. I'm so happy that you agreed to uh, you know to do this. I think the listeners are going to learn a lot, have access, and and maybe get some of their questions answered. You might solve some marital problems too along the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My expertise ends at certain places. I'm, I'm very limited. Right, right. Yeah. Limited. Mechanically, you can describe it, but beyond that, it's uh, right. I don't know if I can describe it. <laughs> I'll leave that to somebody else. We'll have, we have to bring a psychologist in for that yeah. one. Yeah. Maybe we can do on. on uh, and I know you're, you're also very involved, um, or let's say you monitor a lot of the community, you know, what's going on in our community over the years. You've, you've kind of watched and studied. We're not going to go down that path necessarily today, but... Maybe a future show we can touch on it a little bit, but uh, yeah, the world has changed. World has changed. Kingston has changed um, since you and I showed up in 1980 and 82, respectively. And um, you know, but I guess if you, if you go back and look, you know, 20 years or 30 years prior to that, you know, what was Kingston like in the 50s, and what were they like in the thir in the 80s? And they're going to say, oh my gosh, and everything has changed. 1980, 1982. What happened to our Kingston? You know, all these people are coming in and changing it. I, I think every generation you kind of get that same little, like, what the heck's going on here type of thing. But anyway, um, so, yeah, Dr. Ed Alio, audiologist, um, uh, we're, we're happy to have him on the show. Uh, I'm going to sit in for a few months and uh, with him, and um, we have a Thunder Thursday show. That's, that's coming up this uh, – we have this week um, – Richard Catabiani is the is a host who fills in uh, on the fifth Thursdays of the month, and so he has uh, a, a five great, Thursdays in the month. Well, uh, that's the Roman calendar. I don't <laughs> 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 Those Romans were a little crazy, you know. Uh, occasionally there are, yeah. There's a couple, <laughs> I think, <laughs> a couple of Mondays too, but. Um, yeah, so that's, it's going to be a good show coming up. Uh, Barbara Cohen, who you might know, Dr. Joe Cohen, wife, right. wife Barbara, is coming on. And um, uh, let's see, uh, Jillian Bruck, and, um, who has a, who's uh, lost her a brother to substance abuse, 
veteran. So she's going to talk about the uh, veterans organization that she started for veterans that are struggling. And Taylor Bruck, her husband, is the Ulster County historian. So that's going to be the Thursday show. You're going to be, you know, uh, out of the area. But, uh, you know, you can always listen. People can always find uh, this show will be on uh, YouTube probably by Friday. Uh, call or break? No, just a half a minute yeah. for the break. Yeah. So, so we, we uh, upload the shows. Uh, people can watch subsequently to the show, and you can listen in at 92.5 FM. 920, are we getting that signal kind of sort of maybe? AM 920 is back on, okay, good and strong. Is. Okay, yep. great, great, great. And, uh, yeah, this, that signal's been on for a long time, 920 AM. All right, uh, we're going to go to break. Uh, coming back with uh, Dr. Mark Tack. Thank you. And we've got um, Tony Marmo and Dr. Ed Alio. Thank you so much for bringing us around for this first quarter. And you are listening to KCR, Kingston Community Radio, AM 920 and 92.5 FM. My name is Dan Gatiss. It is 7.30 a.m. this Monday, April 26th, and about 38 degrees right now here in Uptown Kingston. A little bit about the weather um, uh, for the next couple days. Today, sunny, a high of 58 tonight. And that means it's a good day today. Tonight, a few passing clouds. And uh, Tuesday, cloudy skies early, then partly cloudy with a high of 67. Tuesday night, cloudy skies, 25% chance of a rain shower Tuesday night. And we'll be right back. Thanks for starting your day with Kingston Community Radio on 920 WGHQ AM Kingston and 92.5 W223 CR FM Kingston, New York. Magic 92.5. Don't. Just don't. If you see a low-hanging or downed wire, don't touch it. Don't move it. Don't go near it. Don't drive over it. It may be a power line carrying an electric current strong enough to kill. But here's what to do. Stay at least 30 feet away and call 911. Central Hudson will take care of the problem. If you come close to a wire, shuffle away with small steps and watch your step. Wires may be hidden in fallen tree limbs or near water. Your safety matters. Hey, so what's a great way to spread awareness that driving high is illegal everywhere? A catchy song, of course. You can Friendly reminder, don't drive high. If you feel different, you drive different. Brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Eleanor Arrow from the town of Ulster, and I support Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. You're with us here at Kingston Community Radio, AM 920 and 92.5 FM, 732 AM, and 38 degrees here on this Monday, April 26th. And um, our call-in number is 331-9255. This upcoming portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Central Hudson. Let's get back to the on-air studio with Dr. Ed Alio and Tony Marmo and our new online guest. Okay, Dan. Thanks so much, folks. Um, this is uh, uh, Medical Monday, uh, uh, and we're. Uh, this is Tony Marmo and Dr. Ed Alio. Ed Alio with us, and I think on the uh, phone is uh, Dr. Tack. Doc, Dr. Mark Tack. Good morning, Dr. Tack. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Ed. How are you doing, Mark? I'm still standing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gl we're glad to have you. We have, uh, you know, with your expertise in infection diseases um, we thought you'd be outstanding and I thought that my first time on this radio show that you'd be a, a, my first great guest to have in the sense of what's going on in our country and what's going on in Kingston and Ulster County and um, so I'd like you to probably give us a, a, a little um, a background or your feelings uh, your expertise on the pandemic but more importantly about the vaccines the three of them and then uh, we'd like you probably to talk about J&J, &J, uh, your thoughts on J&J, &J, the reasons that it was halted, and now the restart. Can, would you help us out there, partner? Sure. <laughs> All that, huh? All that. <laughs> and, and more if you'd like. Yeah. yeah. No we, have to, there. we have to um, break at lunch, Mark. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess my thoughts on the pandemic is the most important one is it's not over. And that we really don't know the direction that it's going to go in. I just heard a survey this morning on national news that uh, 20% of people in the country say they're not going to get the vaccine. And 18% more said they're, you know, very hesitant to get the vaccine. And that's that's a problem because 40% uh, is not going to get us herd immunity uh, the way we need it. So, um, you know, I, I wish uh, I wish people could, you know, I could take a body, you know, I guess there's been a lot of talk about body cams this past couple of weeks. And I wish I could take people along with me with a body cam and let them spend a day or a couple hours walking through a COVID ICU mm -hmm. and understand what that's like when you, when you're in two masks, head covers, gowns, a couple of pairs of gloves and a face shield. You can barely breathe on your own and you're talking to people who are struggling to breathe. And they're our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues. And, and, and they're, they, all they did was get exposed somehow. Mark, so, Mark, uh, you yeah. know, it, it's really um, sad <clears throat> that uh, uh, people don't understand. What would you say to them how, how, to encourage them to make them feel safe? Because they're, they're afraid that the vaccine has uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, side uh, side scary effects or... side effects that they really don't have compared to if you get right. the disease. And what are the concomitant or, or the other problems that people, when they get the virus, if they do get the virus, some people have more lifelong problems or uh, than just having the va the virus and going right. away. Can you tell them, yeah. tell them what you think? Well, let's talk, about the vac let's talk about the vaccines for a second. Okay. So what did we learn from the experience with Johnson & Johnson? We learned that we have the most sophisticated vaccine monitoring program in the world, that we could vaccinate 120 million people and find six people with a side effect tells us that our surveillance system works very, very well. Now, if you had told me about a year ago that we would have three vaccines, all of which would be considered effective, that would cut down the illness by 94% from Moderna and Pfizer and cut down, you know, hospitalizations death by 100% from Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J. I would say, you, you're kidding me. It's not going to happen. If you told me that sick one in a million people might get a rare side effect from one of the vaccines, I would still say, well, we got 500,000 dead people. We have sick, you know, 12 or 13 people with a side effect with one or two people. Uh, not to ever dismiss the seriousness of that, but compare that to the disease yeah. and what that disease has done to our country. Um, we, we've made an incredible progress. I think for, if I was a young woman between 20 and 49 with a history of clots, I would go for Pfizer or Moderna. If otherwise, the risk of the J and J vaccine is extremely, extremely low. And what we do know is we can trust the data because look, we found it, right? right? It's not, I mean, what does that tell you about how good a job they're doing? What about the J and J vaccine being halted? You mentioned six people out of what they they vaccinated seven, seven million, million people. Seven million. Seven million. Yeah, and the seven yeah. people, and one of them, uh, sorry, you know, one person is one too many, but they died, and he's like you said, five hundred thousand people have died from the virus. What about the J and J halting it? How'd you feel about that? What and, and how about turning well, it back on? <laughs> That's more well, important. I think you have to. I think you have, when whenever there's a problem. You have to stop and look at the data. Right. You know, one of the problems with this whole pandemic has been the politicization, the politicalization right. of this pandemic. Is instead of going with the science, what the J and J experience tells us is this is what scientists do. This is what this is what doctors do. We we you know when you test any drug, any vaccine. So when I was when I first came to practice, said we started here in Kingston. I was testing a vaccine for Lyme disease. And that vaccine got approved and came on the market. That vaccine was studied in 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. 
the vaccines used for COVID were studied in 70,000 people. Right, right. Okay. Those are real numbers. But when you study a vaccine in 10,000 people, there is a chance that you're going to have a one in a million side effect that's not going to show up in the 10,000. And you have to be looking for it. But that's no different with a blood pressure pill, a diabetes medicine, right. a cancer treatment, you know, or a new kind of filling a dentist might use. Mm-hmm. It's right? Ama- it's a, you know, it's amazing that people don't, don't, can't draw the relationship between other medications and the vaccine, that it happens even if you take a blood pressure medicine. You don't know if you're one in a million person. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I think that, that yeah, I think that that's the whole issue. And, I, you know, for vaccines in particular, the government had a program in place for, you know, 50 years mm-hmm. called VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And for any shot that's given, a tetanus shot, a polio shot, a measles vaccine, anytime there's a reaction that's unexpected, it's reported. And, and you know, what the J&J experience told us is the system identified what could have been a problem, put a halt on it, looked at the data, said, you know, yes, this might be related. It's still not clear, but probably is, but it's still one in a million. And, and that they, you're going to save between 1,500 and 2,000 lives for one in a million side effect and death, and again, I don't mean to in any way diminish it, was one in seven million. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I think that, and we also, what you do is you identify the group that seems to be at risk. You know, when I, when I started practicing, I was in another pandemic. It was the HIV pandemic. And there's a drug called DDI, and we were using it to treat people with AIDS. And it turns out that in certain women with a geno, with a certain genetic pattern, there's an increased risk of a serious side effect. Well, the drug was out. We found out that there was a problem. They put a halt. They studied it. They figured out who those people were, how to identify them, and we stopped using the drug in that particular population. But we used it for another 15 years mm-hmm. until even better drugs came out. So Jane J. Experience tells us, Look for what the risk is and try to mitigate it. Mark, what about uh, the, the variants that are, you know, constantly seemingly popping up uh, <clears throat> and all over the place? Uh, you know, there's, I think, three or four that I can think of. What, what's, right. what's happening with, with that and how, how is that being addressed in your mind? Well, so there are, two, there are two separate components or three real components to the variants. One, one component to the variants is... Do the vaccines work? And so far, the vaccines are effective, uh, maybe not to the 95%, but very, very high to the variants. So we're, we're not, we are seeing cases, even in people, what are called breakthrough cases, mm-hmm. cases in people who have been vaccinated, but they're not landing up on ventilators and they're not dying. The second part of the, the variants is, this is typically what we expect with viruses. There's always some change and shift in viruses. We saw it with HIV, we've seen it with Mm -hmm. flu, and we've seen it with others. The the key part, the only part that was really uh, sort of a bigger deal was the variants, um, one of the variants seems to be less effectively treated with the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody therapy than the Regeneron. Now, Eli Lilly has come out with a second component to that that helps, but uh, the Regeneron drug still held up. So, and that's really, you know, we're going to be shifting, I think, Tony, from, yeah. and, and from vaccines mm. in the future to therapeutics. So you'll be able to go to your doctor like you get a flu test. You wake up, you don't feel well. The same way we can swab you, we'll swab you for COVID, and we'll have a treatment that works. Mm-hmm. That, so you don't land up intubated on a ventilator and, God forbid, dying. Hey, Mark. Mark, I remember I, that we now have an antibody um, um, uh, medication um, that you utilize with certain age group when they present with the uh, COVID. Is that true? Right. That, that was what I was just talking about. Uh, so there's so Eli Lilly and Regeneron both have drugs on the market that are approved to be used for emergency access. They're called monoclonal antibodies. They're produced in a lab, and they target the pro- this, what's called the M-spike protein on the virus, 
and they 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 have shown a seventy to eighty percent reduction in people admitted to the hospital requiring increasing oxygen, intubated, and and dying. But they have to be yeah. given early. They have to be used in people who, before they're on high levels of oxygen or they're sick, and they're really used in targeted groups. <clears throat> so anybody over the age of 65, anybody over the age of 50 with high blood pressure, COPD, or heart disease, or anybody over the age of 17 with diabetes or a BMI, uh, which is a measure of your weight, body mass index, over 35. And so those are the approved criteria, and we've been using them, and they've been very, very effective. Mm -hmm. It's not really well known out there, I don't think, as much. Nope. Uh, I know well, our, pres our former president uh, had the opportunity to do it, and, and there was some good results there, and then I think it just kind of tailed off. Well, one of the challenges, Tony, is that the companies, because they're emergency use access and they're not, quote, FDA approved, across, you can't just write a script for it. Right. Um, they're not, the companies are not allowed to advertise. Oh, I see. At all. Okay. So there's no advertisement at all for these. It's all physician uh, and, and word of mouth to the community. Okay. And it turns out that the rate of use is extremely variable from community to community. Mm -hmm. How are we doing in Ulster? We're, we're we're doing okay. Not as not as good not as good as we could, but a lot better than others. It, you really do have to identify those patients at an early stage and get them in. Where we're, we are, we're, where we are good is we the process. Once we identify them, we have a process through Northern Duchess and Kingston Hospital Health Alliance that's very very effective. That well, works. The Mark, is, you know we're, we're we're lucky to have you in both sides of the river here. Um, how how uh, well educated are the primaries <clears throat> regarding the therapies? Well, you know they're, they're they're pretty good. I mean, again, it's always an individual level. I, I think that it's more and more of them are aware of it. I think the problem is that a lot of the testing is done at at outside sites, and so the the health department people get the mm -hmm. results. And the people calling them with the results or the, or the lab cores and quests aren't stopping to ask the question and say, okay, you're positive, now what? Now do you qualify? That's got to be the next question. The, the minute we have a positive test, the next question has to be, is there something we can do to help you? Besides just say, stay home. So is, is Dr. Smith involved with this in the health department? Carol Smith. Carol Smith? Yeah. Well, Carol, I mean, Carol is very aware of everything going on in the county, but the, the actual infusions, see, it's not, it's, it's a challenge because and you have to give this infusion, it's, it's an IV medicine, it's given over one hour, and there has to be one hour monitoring. So it has to be in a monitored site, and it has to be, you know, a safe site, because you're giving it to people who are COVID positive. It's like I have an infusion center on my practice on Washington Avenue, but I can't bring COVID positive patients in, in and out at various times throughout the day without putting my entire practice in jeopardy. I just don't have a system to do that. We have an infusion center at Health Alliance where we give chemotherapy and blood transfusions. We can't bring COVID positive patients and mix them with cancer patients. Mm -hmm. So we had to create a system or a location, and Kingston Hospital and Northern Duchess have done that, where we can bring people in, get them into a safe and controlled environment without putting the rest of that environment in jeopardy. And the, the two hospitals have done a great job, and the health department really doesn't get into therapeutics. So well, I was just I was just more treat. concerned, I'm not concerned, I was more, I was thinking along the line of the health department gets their results, and then do they, are they, do they encourage the primary, do the primaries receive these results? Not all the time. And uh, because the primary knows <clears throat> what the um, other problems of the patient, whether they're overweight, if they have diabetes, what their age is, heart disease. And uh, so if they don't get that information, that person may not uh, uh, well, be the, the front line. The patient might call their doctor, right? Their, their primary, well, maybe, maybe. I mean, I would think if someone yeah. tests positive for COVID, you know. <laughs> Yeah, right. You, you, they should. They should be contacting a physician, maybe, and say, right. 
you know, what, what should I do or what are my options here? What, 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 is, the the ju- what is the direction? How do we uh, educate people to, to follow through? Uh, well, I think, I think we do it just the way we're doing it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, get, we, just, we, we get the information out to the public, public in any version or access. I, you know, I had contacted the Freeman months ago about this and asked him to run a front page or a story about it, you know, so that people who read the paper would have access to it. It unfortunately never got done. Of shocking. course. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. but, uh, well, you know, call them out. It's, it's reality. Well, you know, maybe we'll do that. It, yeah. You yeah. know, in terms of getting the information out, unfortunately the health department is tagged with contact tracing and notification and, and the number of people that, the, the people that work under Carol Smith at the health department are so overwhelmed Correct. with contact tracing and identifying and tracking and now you know, distributing vaccine across the county that the idea of, you know, trying to call the patients and, and get into their medical information yeah. and who they're, and, and a lot of people unfortunately don't have primary doctors um, to begin with. And right. so <clears throat> I think we just have to educate and educate and just try to get the information out there that if you're COVID positive, there, you know, depending upon your age and your medical condition, there's an opportunity to help you. I've lost patients, and we've lost patients and neighbors who never got that opportunity. Right. And the out, the outcome may have been different had we had that chance to intervene earlier. Well, the the county administrator was on the other day. I heard him on radio, and he said that fifty percent of the people in our county have either had both doses or at least one dose. And now the the game plan is to get the rest of them, and they're having difficulty getting a lot of the people educated. So we're glad you're on talking about this, Mark. Um, I was going into uh, Target last week, and this fellow stopped me, and he said, if you haven't been vaccinated, go next door to the old uh, Best, Buy. Best Buy. They've got extra vaccines because people don't show up. And I happened to be on the phone with somebody, and I said, you can't get your vaccine? Come now. And, yeah. they, and they came. But uh, it's interesting that we have vaccines that go begging as a result because people don't show up or they make schedule themselves at two or three places and they forget to cancel. But I think now, well, too, they have walk-ins, right, Mark? Don't they have walk-ins? That, that, is, that is correct. So uh, we've gone through this transition. Um, you know, I've used an analogy a bunch of times of like a sink where you turn on the faucet and the water is dripping out, and you are trying to fill a cup. In the beginning of the vaccine, we had people waiting thirsty for that cup to fill up. And now the water is running free of fluid, and everybody's gotten their, you know, the people that want it have had a shot at it. Mm-hmm. And so now we have to get the people who are hesitant to understand that this is the path back to, you know, to life for all of us. Mm-hmm. And you're not just protecting yourself. You're protecting your husband, your wife, your parents, your your neighbors, um, because uh, again, to underestimate this virus is incredibly foolish. Uh, I'm still really, you know, uh, every case is personal to me, and we lost a 33 year old mm. 10 days ago across the river in, Nor- in uh, Vassar. That's amazing. And the only risk that person had was he was overweight. Okay, and they, and then you know as is probably 40% of the United States. All right. So that 33 years old, you know. <clears throat> yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, it's sad that people, what... it's, Mark, it's sad that people don't understand that. I was talking to a woman. I, I, I wish she was listening, but I'm sure she's not. Uh, and I was trying to tell her, she's, I'm not going to get the vaccine. And I said, you know, that's, in a way, on her end, anyhow, it's pretty selfish. Yeah. You know, because the people she's around really can't afford to get sick. But people don't, they don't see that. They're scared. They think there's all kinds of other repercussions like, you know. Well, that's the media, right? Is that the media talking to people? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think the well, message. You know, again, we get into the politics when, the, <clears throat> when our, our former president goes on national news and says, oh, it's really no big deal. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, wrong answer. Yeah. I mean, be, be very afraid of it, okay? Yeah. Because, it, you know, it, it kills Republicans and Democrats equally. It has no political affiliation. Yeah, it is like okay. cancer in that sense. You know, there 
There also always been a percentage of anti-vaxxers or anti-vaccine, doesn't matter. They, you know, that seems like it's grown for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, again, people are not doing their own research. They're listening to the talking heads on, on the uh, TV shows. And, and they have to do their own research and their own, you know, investigation and, and speak to the experts that are in our local communities. You know, I mean, well, you know, <clears throat> I think that one of the things you have to remember is who are these people that created these vaccines and these treatments? You know, this is not some magical people living in the mountains that never come, you know. These are our neighbors. <laughs> right. These, you know, these are our friends, <laughs> our family members, our neighbors our high school and college classmates. These were very smart people, but we know them. They're not out there saying, let's see if I can get a vaccine that knocks a third of the population off. I mean, you know, that's not what we're out there. You know, these people are, are on the front line trying to save people's lives. And, and incredibly, they did a great job. They did. You know? And, they did. Well, and I, I just want to throw a shout out for a second yep. to the nurses and the patient care techs and the transporters, and the ER docs, and the and my colleagues out there, because I got to tell you, every day they get up, they put on their shoes, they go to work, and they they put on their masks and their goggles, and they go into these rooms, and they're taking care of people, and they're treating them with incredible dignity and respect, and they're doing everything they can to keep these people healthy and alive. And, you know, it, it's, yes, they are heroes. They, they truly are. Yeah. And, um, you know, I tell people, I don't want to be here. I'll be happy just being a survivor. But the people I work around, particularly the nurses, they are my heroes every day. Yeah, it's right. a great point, Mark. That's a good point. Good <clears throat> shout out there. You know, we know we know so much more today than we did when the uh, uh, pandemic started a year ago. And, uh, you know, how do we how do we take advantage of that? I mean, uh, you know, from the treatment standpoint to the, you know, just screening standpoint. I mean, it's, you know, how do, how do we do this? Well, we, we need a reset, Tony. We need to <clears throat> we need to get the politics out. Right. OK. Yeah. We need to get back to science. You know, I mean, the way the same way we've controlled the HIV epidemic, we take the emotion and the politics out and we treat. We go to the science. You know, the, the medications in HIV work. People are living normal lives. I have, I have people getting organ transplants yeah, for amazing. HIV positive now. <clears throat> used to be we, a death could, sentence, right? You get AIDS, right. you're dead. The, the science, we go to the science. We get away from the emotion. We go back to the data. We go back to the facts. Right. Well, it took HIV... You know, people to settle down. It took them years. We can't afford years here no. with the pandemic, you know. Right. People need to be well, educated. They need to appreciate. I mean, what happens, again, the news media, they come on and they go, the, the vaccine, the Chinese vaccine isn't working. The Russian vaccine isn't working. And that immediately, you know, when you listen to the news media, they stir people up to think pot. that our three vaccines are the same as theirs, and they're not even close. You know, you have no. We have no idea how lucky we are right. yes. to have three vaccines available. Yeah. To, to be, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I would only wish again this the image. You know, back in I think it was May, my son Benjamin, who was a third, was a second year resident uh, down in Long Island, uh, working in COVID units, sixty, seventy, eight hours a week, and hmm. you know, went through a possible overwhelm, got infected with COVID. And here was my son who was, at the time, training to run the New York Marathon. Jeez. And my wife and I were FaceTiming with him, and he was sitting on the floor next to his bed, and he looked wiped out. I said, why don't you just sit up on bed? He couldn't pick himself up to stand up yeah. just to get onto bed. Twenty, He was 28 years old. He's fine. Thank God he's fine now. Yeah. But not everybody that got the virus is. There are people who are what are called long haulers. You mentioned them earlier. Right. And... There are people I have who have gotten COVID and have survived, but whose lives are not going to be the same. Yeah. And you only have to see that that image of him will stay with me. You know, I, as a father, oh, I felt yeah. so guilty. My son went into medicine, and, you know, I kept thinking he was going to die from this. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's uh, it, it was it was horrifying for my wife and I to 
and, and you know, and I'm, I'm very proud of him. He's actually starting an infectious disease fellowship in <laughs> Georgetown, July 1st. That's an apple in a tree situation there. Dr. Mark Tack, uh, thank you so much for coming on. We have about 30 seconds left uh, before we have to go to break, but... Um, you know, we, we'd love to have you back on. Uh, we would. We when, would. When, Mark, uh, you did a great and, job. And thank you for being a champion and, and being out there and coming on the show. And, um, you know, you're, you're a great guy. And thankfully, we have you in our community and others in the community. So uh, uh, we have, you know, but people have to get they have to get serious and busy and not think that this thing is over because it's not. And get the vaccine. It's not. Get the and, vaccine. And, and, Tony, I appreciate all that, but. I'm surrounded every day by heroes. Believe I hear you. Well, you're one yourself. So thank no, you. No, thank no. you. I know, I know you don't like to no. hear that. I'm going to tell you anyway. All no. right. <laughs> Dr. Mark Tack, thank you very much. No. Uh, take care. Be well. Be safe. Uh, Dan, take us away. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Mark Tack um, of MAHV Infectious Diseases. Thank you. And uh, many, many thanks to Dr. Ed Alio and Tony Marmo for uh, bringing us this Medical Monday. It is KCR, Kingston Community Radio, WGHQ, AM 920 and 92.5 FM. 8 o'clock AM this Monday, April 26th, 39 degrees now here in Uptown Kingston. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio was brought to you by Central Hudson. And um, a little uh, weather and forecast for the next couple days. Sunny, high of 58 today. Tonight, a few passing clouds, and uh, Tuesday, sunny skies again early, then uh, partly cloudy, um, and a high of 67. And Tuesday night, cloudy skies, 25% chance of a rain shower. And uh, we'll be right back after these messages. Thanks for starting your day with Kingston Community Radio on 920 WGHQ AM Kingston and 92.5 W223CR FM Kingston, New York. Magic 92.5. Central Hudson reminds you, when it comes to your home's wiring, safety matters. Overheated electric cords or outlets are signs of inadequate wiring. Within your wall, in an appliance, or both. Circuit breakers or fuses that trip often is usually a sign that a circuit is overloaded, an appliance is faulty, or something is wrong that can shock a person or cause a fire. Have a trained electrician troubleshoot such problems immediately. Hey Dad, your prescription will be ready in just a minute. Hey Dad, your laundry will be ready in just a minute. Dad, your lunch will be ready in just a minute. Hey honey, why don't you take a minute? When you help care for a loved one, you give them as much time as you can. But it's just as important to take time for yourself. AARP can help. Find free care guides to support you and your loved one at aarp.org slash caregiving. That's aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Diane Eastwick from Athens, New York. And I support Kingston Community Radio, and so should you. You're listening to WGHQ, AM 920 and 92.5 FM, the home of Kingston Community Radio. My name is Dan Gatiss, and it is 8 to 3 a.m. And Monday, April 26, 39 degrees here in Uptown Kingston. The following segment of KCR is brought to you by Herzog's. Stop by Herzog's Home and Paint Center in the Kingston Plaza for all of your home building, and maintenance, and painting needs. Discover the difference of buying local. Herzog's employees have been a part of the Herzog's family for years and they value personal customer service and being close to the community. And let's get back to the on-air studio with Dr. Ed Alio and Tony Marmo and our new guest. Welcome back. Thanks a lot, Dania. Welcome back, folks, to our our version of Medical Monday. uh, this is Tony Marmo, and, and my only affiliation with this whole medical world is that I ran Kingston Hospital for nine years. I just just throw that out there. It was in a long time ago, like a lifetime ago. Seems like it. But then I ran nursing homes for ten years, and that was also a challenge. Yeah. You know, interesting world. So you're back in your wheelhouse. Well, I love Dr. Alio. It's great, great to have well, him. Thank here. you, Tony. Uh, 
And we're joined by, uh, um, you want to introduce your friend, Dr. Ken? Yeah, we have Dr. Ken Kirscher with us. He's a dermatologist here in Kingston area, Lake Katrine to be exact. And uh, I've known um, Ken for a number of years. Matter of fact, he's educated me on skin cancers, and that's been one of our topics. Uh, I thought I knew something, but hanging around with him, I learned a lot more. Um, and um, this is uh, May, he just told me, is a Melanoma Awareness Month. Mm. He's going to talk about that a little bit. And, um, and whatever else. And feel free to call in if you have questions because uh, he's a wealth of information. And, uh, Ken? 331-9255 uh, will be the number yeah, to right. call in. Talk to Dan. Dan will tee up the call and get the question out there. Uh, so tell us about the melanoma and awareness. And uh, maybe you can give us a little progression on skin cancers. It starts out with basal cell. Can it get worse and how much worse and what could happen? Sure, sure, sure. Well, uh, first of all, there are hundreds of types of skin cancer, but we talk about the big three. Mm -hmm. We talk about the basal cell, the squamous cell, and melanoma. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't go from one to the other. There are three different types of cells in the skin. And so a basal cell is always going to be a basal cell, a squamous cell is always going to be a squamous cell, and a melanoma is going to be a melanoma. There are subtypes of each of those big three, and they can change within that. But a melanoma will always be a melanoma. And, and so let, let's let's start off with the basal cell because that's that's the most common. Mm -hmm. And what most folks don't appreciate is that uh, basal cell skin cancer is the most common cancer. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear about prostate cancer, we hear yeah, about yeah. breast cancer, or whatever, basal. lung cancer. Basal cell <clears throat> outstrips them all by a long shot. Mm -hmm. Luckily as the most common cancer, it's also one of the least worrisome, certainly of the, of the big three skin cancers, it's the least worrisome, but one of the less worrisome cancers, period. Well, if you don't treat it, what could happen? Uh, really bad things can happen. It could kill you. Uh, that, that's a bad thing. Well, that's pretty bad. So, yeah. it sounds a little more worrisome then. Yeah. Uh, luckily, if, if uh, left untreated, right? Right. Yeah, but luckily, right. uh, basal cell is not one of those things that turns into wildfire. You know, you get a basal cell, it starts growing, it grows slowly and usually very methodically, getting larger and larger, warning you, warning you, warning you before it starts to invade uh, a, a vital structure. So there's lots of time to intercede, uh, and usually it's a, a- Sometimes years? Yeah, sometimes years, and and, uh, and, and usually it requires you know a, a minor surgery, and it's cured, mm -hmm. which is amazing, right? So, um, but the most common places for basal cell to occur are on the face and head and those sun, sun exposed areas, and so, you don't want to let the thing get to the size of a half dollar before you decide to take off someone's nose. And, you know, we've taken off entire noses. I've taken out eyeballs and entire ears. And so while it might not kill someone, it can really be a deforming uh, thing, you know. So, um, so you know, it's something that, you know, we're always on people, you know, and we're going to come back to sun avoidance and, and SPF in just a little bit. But the, the next player in that trio is the squamous cell. And, and squamous cells, some of those can be very mild and not so worrisome, but I've certainly lost my a handful of patients over the years to squamous cell. Uh, and they metastasize much more readily than the basal cell can. Uh, and again, face, head, sun-exposed areas. So when you say metastasize, for, for some of the listeners, you know, what's that mean, metastasize, and where does it go? Sure. Well, that, that's, that's a really, I'm glad you brought that up, because that's a really important distinction to make. You know, metastasis, metastasis, it's not staying where it started. It's spreading to some distant part of the body, uh, you know, and, and some areas of the body have a much higher rate of metastasis. Exactly, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Leo is just, you know, indicating the mouth, you know, like if you get a squamous cell on your arm, that is a low to mild risk or, or moderate risk, depending on the type of squamous cell. But if you have a squamous cell on your lip or something, that is a very high risk lesion and really needs to be addressed uh, because that can spread and, and, you know, and take your life. So that's. That's that's important because uh, I think some one time I brought somebody in to see you and they had a basal cell and she came out and said, well, uh, he, he said, no big deal. Uh, I, I don't have any cancer. And I said, it's called basal cell carcinoma. Right, right. it is a carcinoma. <laughs> yeah. But 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 it, because it it, it isn't uh, you know as deadly. 
um, and easily treated. I think people uh, slough that off. But c- continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. No. That, that, that's that's all really important stuff. And and you know one of the things I try to talk to my patients about is you know you just can't lump all of basal cells or all squamous cells or all of melanomas together in one category you know there are some cancers that are very superficial and are very low risk we scrape them off in the office in five minutes you get a little round vaccine looking scar and and you're done no big deal others require you know more significant surgery so Mm -hmm. so what about the melanoma well, the melanoma, you know, the least common of the three, but is also, you know, the most terrifying, right? And um, and so I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about melanoma because it really needs a little refinement. We just can't say melanoma, mm-hmm. right? So uh, every year, the AJCC, the American Joint Committee on Cancer, they evaluate all cancers, not just skin cancer, mm-hmm. but they, they come up with the new guidelines for lung cancer and ovarian cancer and, and every cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh and, and so they came out with new guidelines in 2018 on melanoma, and uh, they talk about the depth, the depth, the depth, the depth. So a very superficial melanoma has a very, very high cure rate. Mm-hmm. A deep melanoma is really dangerous. Uh, and in the past, it was a death sentence. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, hey, get your affairs in order death sentence. There was very little to do about that. Luckily, with the advent of immunotherapy and the, and the advances in, in chemotherapy, there are some people who are living with metastatic melanoma. Uh, they're not using the word cured, certainly, mm-hmm. but they're going about having a life, and their melanoma is not progressing so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it is a really, really bad cancer to have if you let it progress. I remember years ago, uh, Dr. I mean, Senator Kennedy, um, uh, Ted Kennedy, mm-hmm. his son got a melanoma on his leg. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> this was probably back in, what, the 80s or something like that, and they amputated his leg. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah I, have, I, have, I have lots of patients who only have three or four toes or three or four fingers because there's just not a way to clear that melanoma off that digit without amputation. taking amputation. Sun yeah. exposure is some of the reason, but not yeah, all the reason. Not all. You, you know, and it's hard in medicine to say all for anything. Right, right. But, but, you know, one of the great examples is Australia, right? So you have this equatorial country mm-hmm. that is populated by people from Northern Europe, right? So you have a bunch of very white, white people living in a very tropical area. Mm-hmm. And it's no, no surprise that they have the highest melanoma rates in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the Australians have responded brilliantly to it. So, for example, it's, it's illegal to send your kids to school without a hat, you know, like because <laughs> yeah. they, it's clear that sun exposure is the cause. Yeah. And, and, you know, intense short sun exposures is, is, seems to be a higher rate <laughs> risk uh, factor than kind of these mild sun exposures over you to the course of your whole life. Yeah. Um, so I, this is really a bad segue, but yeah. we missed it at the top of the hour. Excuse us. No, no, lay it. We Come have on, to do a little out. business. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, bring it on. We, we <laughs> no, can. I'm sorry. We, I, we have to wish uh, every day we do happy birthdays, and, and uh, Boy Steary Melkhouse gives a cow pie away, uh, and, and we, that's my fault for uh, uh, I'm so intrigued by the, the being back in the medical world. Uh, so, Absolutely. Yes, yeah. we were. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, we so anyway, it. we want to wish a happy birthday to uh, Cynthia Babb. Uh, love mother, Penny, family members, and, uh, and many friends. Have a glorious birthday. And uh, since Cynthia is our only birthday uh, uh, entry today, uh, she is the winner of the delicious cow pie at 62 O'Neill Street, Kingston. It does have calories, Ed. Just okay. Well, and, 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 and now there's no, there's no call in since my birthday. We're over. We're done with Yeah, it. well, yeah. But uh, <laughs> next year, we'll get you next year. So happy birthday, Cynthia Babb, April 26th. And enjoy your cow pie. Nice. Sorry, Doc. No, it's, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we were going to do the ditter ditter. Yeah, we do this too. We okay. This. Moo. Happy birthday, Cynthia. Cynthia Babb. Cow bell. Is that, that official? That is a cow bell from a cow pie. Oh this is a real gosh. cow. This is another cow bell. There you go. That's for a bigger cow. All right. We have a, we have a phone call. Sorry for that break. Uh, I'm going to get fired. We have a uh, We have a caller. Good morning, caller. You're on uh, KCR Medical Monday. Uh, good morning. It's good to have you on. Um, I have a uh, question for the doctor there. Um, when I go in sometimes, I'm told I have uh, precancerous. 
Yes. What do you mean by precancerous? Is it something that's going to turn cancerous? You have to keep an eye on it or? Well, that, that's a really good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Boy, I, I feel like I, this is like the perfect segue because that was what I, I wanted to bring up just in a few minutes. So um, often when, when patients come in, you know, we're, we do these scanning exams, right? We do skin checks. We do skin cancer screenings. And, uh, so um, one of the things we often find are these precancers. And again, often on the sun-exposed areas, face, head, neck, back of hands, forearms, uh, those, the official term for those is called an actinic keratosis. And, you know, medicine kills me. You know, we all like to speak in Latin or Greek, but actinic <laughs> just means Russian. sun, you know, induced. And, and keratosis is these rough bits of skin, you know, these overgrowths of skin. And basically those are skin cells that have been damaged by the ultraviolet light, right? Those mm -hmm. penetrate into your skin and damage your DNA. That's how that whole thing works. And those cells are starting to grow abnormally and left untreated, not every one, but certainly a proportion of those will turn into skin cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's where we, you know, when we talk about preventing cancer, we talk about, you know, primary prevention, i.e. don't go out and get sun, and we're going to address that in a few minutes. And then, okay, well, geez, you know, you were raised in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and we didn't have awareness and sunscreen playing so, baseball all day long or outside right, all exactly day long. swimming and went outside all day long right haying as yeah, i did right. when i was a kid with no t-shirt on you yeah, know right, right um uh and then so then the next thing is well you've had this exposure now we should be upping our surveillance game right we should be looking at we you know you're a light complected person you've had a lot of sun you're someone we should be watching and so that's what you know your dermatologist is looking for and and skin cancer uh, and that's a good place to intercede, right? It's not cancer yet. Let's not let it turn to cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's what your dermatologist is doing. And, and I have a, a couple of bits I want to talk about that in just a few minutes. Ellen, um, did that address your uh, question, Evelyn? Uh, yes, it does, you know. Okay. And um, I am a patient of yours, Dr. Oh, I know who you are. <laughs> no. uh, I, I recognize the voice. Great to hear Great. you. Great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm very happy that you're on, that, you know, you're answering these questions that people, you know, have. You know, Great. so, um, but thank you for letting right. me you know about that because I was wondering, you know, because I know I go in sometimes, people tell me I have, it's precancerous. I have had three um, basal cells removed already by you, you know, a while back, you know, and I really appreciate your care and all your knowledge. Well, thank so, you so much. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank Thanks. You thank you so, so much. And have a good day. Bye. Thanks. <clears throat> so, so I just want to, uh, you know, go back to melanoma just for a minute because that, that really is such an important topic. So, you know, uh, luckily, you know, since there has been this increased awareness of melanoma, people are, you know, are paying attention to it. They're wearing sunscreen more. They're covering their kids more, which is really great. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're coming in to get screened. And, and so the trend has been that we're finding melanomas while we're finding more of them, we're finding them at an earlier stage, mm -hmm. which is fantastic, right? Because as I said, you know, when the new AJCC guidelines, um, you know, it's all about depth. The deeper the melanoma, the more frightening it is. The deeper the melanoma, the more we have to do to you, right? So a very superficial, eh, cut the thing out, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Not no big deal, but yeah, the cure rate is 98%. You know, that's right. fantastic. If you get a deep melanoma, all of a sudden we're cutting into lymph nodes. You're having PET scans and CAT scans and MRIs, and you're potentially going on one of these therapies, which is not a free ride, right? Mm -hmm. Every, all that chemo stuff has right. significant side effects, yeah. Um, so, you know, that's where the American Academy of Dermatology, and I know all, every dermatologist I know, really is harping on their patients and really looking to try and get these things at a very early stage because the prognosis is fantastic mm -hmm. and, and we don't have to do horrible things to our patients. Yeah. So that's really key. You were mentioning uh, earlier about a, uh, a new drug that you want to yeah, talk so about. you know, this is this goes right back to the phone call. So the phone call was really a you know perfect segue. I, I have to pay her next time. <laughs> um, so you know, or not bill her anyway. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, so you know, um, so th this this very common lesion, this AK actinic keratosis that that we're we're treating all the time. 
you know, in, in the past, there just wasn't that many options to treat the thing, you know. And, and most of my patients come in and we freeze a spot or two, no big deal. We spray them with liquid nitrogen, which is very cold. It's 300 degrees below zero. We burn the skin there. Mm -hmm. The abnormal cells are killed because they're frozen. We could apply heat, uh, but we freeze them. Uh, and then normal cells growing in their place. Easy. I kind of call that whack-a-mole, you know? The thing sticks up his head, you, you smack it on the head, you know? Like a fly swatter. Yeah, yeah. There you But go. smaller. Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a great way to treat it. But, you know, we have these guys who come in, you know, hey, I'm an Irish roofer my whole life. Well, you can't play whack-a-mole with that yeah, guy, right? right? They've right, got right. 50 or 70 of these. Or if the guy's hairline looks like my, mine, you know, you readers, uh, listeners can't see, but I'm, I'm pretty darn bald. Uh, you know. And pretty like a black. You're on YouTube. Yeah, right, right. We're on YouTube. Oh, okay. There you so. go. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, but I have guys who come in with a scalp full of these things and a face full of them. You know, they're boaters or sailors or golfers. Oh, are you kidding? Golfing is like the worst thing in the world for your skin. Uh, but, but, you know, if they have 50 or 70 of them, what are you going to do? So, uh, so about 40 years ago, we started um, using a, a chemotherapy drug called fluorouracil. Four zero years ago? Four, 40. Four zero, yeah. Four a long zero. time ago, okay. we started using this chemo cream. Okay. And, and it came about, uh, someone was getting fluorouracil injected in their vein, IV, for another cancer, and some astute physician noticed that all their precancers fell off and they said, wow, geez, that's pretty good. Yeah. Why don't we try putting that in a cream and smearing it on them so we don't have to make them sick sick with right, it because it's right. a toxic We're thing. Right. right, and and it works and it works pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is to do that, you have to, someone has to smear this on their skin for a month mm -hmm. and they get mm -hmm. red and irritated and it's not a mm -hmm. pleasant month. And a lot of people don't like to do it in the summer months and I don't blame mm -hmm. them because the sun makes it more uncomfortable with the heat. So th that's where we lived for many years. And then 20 so years ago, you know, we're not counting dates here, date, you know, specifically, uh, a new drug came out called Imiquimod or Aldara. And that was, uh, it's a much more elegant drug. It stimulates the body's immune system. So you put this stuff on, it's not toxic like fluorouracil. You put this stuff on your skin and it stimulates your immune system. It revs up your immune system. And then the immune system says, oh gosh, I should have been attacking this precancer. <laughs> and it does. I was sleeping. <laughs> right. And, and the immune system does get lazy, especially when you uh, put sun on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, a, you know, the immune system really does get dopey in the skin with prolonged sun use. So that works great too. But again, it's still four weeks of therapy. You get red and crusty and irritated. It's not a great month. Better during the pandemic, evidently, because mm -hmm. people are locked in their homes. Right, right, you know? right. and I just want to uh, shout out to Mark Tack. Mark Tack yeah, and Charles Cutler and that whole infectious disease crew. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. You know, we yeah, do some things uh, well here in Kingston as far as <clears throat> medical care. Our infectious disease doctors here in the county are, like, top-notch. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, and then about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, they came out with a light therapy. You put this cream on someone, they hang around for a while, you get the cream to penetrate their skin, you expose them to an activating light of a specific wavelength, and there are several of them, so we won't go into the minutia. Uh, and that, they get, it's like jamming a whole month of cream into one session, okay? Yeah. But they leave and they're pretty irritated. I always tell my patients when we do this, this is like going to be that one of those worst sunburn feelings you ever had. So you're going to want to take a little Advil and some yeah. uh, Benadryl tonight, and you're going to be uncomfortable. But it's a one-day thing. And then you have about a 7- to 10-day healing period as opposed to a month and then a week of healing. So a lot of patients really like that. We've shortened up the course. And, and it's kind of funny. This is a lesion we've been treating for 100, uh, 100 years. And, and all of a sudden, just this year, three new things came out. One is some very smart doctors figured out a new way to do the light treatment where literally instead of doing 10 minutes of light, you put the cream on them and you do 30 minutes of light. There's no incubation period. There's no coming back to the office two hours later. You get about the same results and it's much less inflammation. So they're not suffering for that first few days. They do get red and scaling and they have to live with that for a week. The second thing is we learned how to use that fluorouracil cream in a new way, and that really just came out. Amazingly, I, again, I think it was an accident. A patient was using a psoriasis cream, and they put their fluorouracil on, cream on, and they had a cr really strong reaction. 
And now there's a new protocol where you just do that for four or five days. And then you still have a couple of weeks of redness as you, you get very intensely red and inflamed. But again, we've shortened that course up from a m five weeks to two weeks, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. And then this, then just literally two weeks ago, a new drug was announced. It's not even available yet. It's called Clyceri. Okay, hold that thought because yep, yep. we're going to take a quick call. Good morning, caller. You're on with Dr. Ken Kircher. What's your question or comment? Good morning, Tony. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you, Mike? I'm, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, Doc, uh, I, I, I've come to understand over the past uh, 20 or 15 or so years how important dermatologists are. Um, one problem that I've had, however, is that many of the creams and or other uh, other items that are used to treat skin uh, skin diseases often are not imp approved by insurance companies. I'd like to get your take on that. Approved by insurance companies? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that is. I'm really glad you brought that up. That because this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, in every one of my exam rooms, I have a poster hanging that says. If the medication that we recommend or prescribe is not affordable to you, right? Because for some person that might be 20 bucks, for some pe person that might be 50 bucks, we, you know, call us and we will find an alternative or an alternative way to get you that medication. Uh, you know, the drug reps hate coming into my office <laughs> because I hammer them. I really yeah, do. I beat yeah. them up. I'm like, hey, you know, yeah. you guys got to bring the prices down and I need some freebies here. I got yeah, someone right. who can't get your medicine and they need it. So I don't want some crappy little sample. I want a tube of this that I can pass on to right. somebody. Right. Um, so, you know, we do our best to find alternatives. Luckily, uh, our, our new software can tell us what the cost is most times. Uh, before the patient leaves so we can start looking for an alternative for them. Uh, we also use a thing called GoodRx, and I would recommend that you uh, discuss this with every physician you see. GoodRx is a free program. They can give you a card or print one out on their printer in their mm -hmm. office. They can find the pharmacy closest to you that will honor that coupon, and often it's dramatically cheaper than you would pay uh, mm -hmm. through your regular insurance. I don't know how they make a dime on that, GoodRx, yeah. folks, but... Um, it's really been a tremendous asset to my patients. But, but it's also really, it comes back to your doc. You know, it, it's, it's important for them to prescribe a treatment that is accessible for their patient, yeah. you know. And some of the drug companies are really uh, unscrupulous in their mm -hmm. charging. It's Actually, I might add uh, just one, I might interject one thing here. Uh, it, it is my belief and... And it probably was that of my dermatologist that insurance companies think that a lot of those creams and uh, and other uh, medications are like a luxury kind of thing, like to make you look beautiful. Right. Uh, yeah. But that's a different kind of cream. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, yeah. I I I I, und I understand that, but. You these know, are, but, these are you know what, what, when I was given a, the prescription, and then I'm, I, I, I take it to my drugstore, and, uh, and 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 the and the and the pharmacist says, you know how much this is going to cost you. Uh, yeah. Needless yeah. to say. I, I, I'm, I'm hanging on for dear life. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you know, I, I often, you know, because I, <clears throat> like, you know, I, I have insurance too, right? And I have a, I have a, uh, an eighteen hundred dollar deductible because yeah. you know that's what we got stuck with, and, and we have a five thousand fam dollar family yeah. deductible. So, uh, I, you know, we're in the same boat. But, but again, you know, working with your your doc and whether it's a dermatologist or your cardiologist, they can look for alternatives uh, and go to bat for you a little bit on that. And Mike, we have to move on. We only have about a minute. I'm sorry. Thank you for calling. Oh. Oh, okay, Tony, okay. and 10 straight for the next tonight. Have a yeah. good day. <laughs> right, thanks. 
You know, I just got to say, you know, these half-hour shows are awesome, but I just... They go I, fast, I just man. talk too much, man. I, I have got too much to, you know, I could <laughs> sit here... What else you got? You got about a minute and change. Well, so... And over, too. So, where, yeah, where's yeah, your yeah, office? So, where, where's your office? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm right up in Lake Katrine, uh, right, right behind uh, the, the credit union near Romeo Chevrolet. Um, uh, right over the railroad tracks. You're on the yeah. other side of the tracks. I'm on the other. That's my whole life, man. <laughs> Talk about the Northeast Center for Special Care. Exactly, exactly. And, what uh, else did you want to get in? Did you have any other? Uh, you, we, I stopped you on the, when you named the drug. And yeah, the, yeah. The call. Last drug. Yeah. It, it, well, so <laughs> what's fantastic about this new Kleiseri is, again, it's a, a four- to five-day application, minimal irritation, uh, not, I shouldn't say minimal, but c comparatively. So less irritation and uh, people are getting a great response. So uh, yeah. it's just, a, it's an interesting evolution. You know, you would think such an old problem, we wouldn't have that many new tricks to pull out of our you know, bag. But. These, these therapeutics um, may be irritating or an irritant. Um, it's sort of like the virus, you know, you don't want to get it. Uh, you know, uh, when Dr. Tack was talking about the long haulers, sure. if you get it, you could end up with something worse down the road, a heart condition, mm -hmm. a kidney condition. Sure. And so as much as an irritant, minor or otherwise, that these therapeutics are that you put on the skin is better than letting it go and not doing it. And, and, with a bigger and, problem. And talking right. about the therapeutics and the co-pays that we have, you know, I think that in our society, people have have... have lost track of the fact that it, I'm sorry to say this, it does cost money. And we have big deductibles. And the deductibles, you know, as big as they are, really um, are a result of people overusing, overprescribing in the past mm -hmm. and having inexpensive medications. And now, you know, you got to have $1,500 for one person or $5,000 for a family. Well, because we need to look at treatment program as catastrophic mm -hmm. you know you don't want to go in uh in, in an automobile accident you know uh, that's catastrophic uh, so the therapeutics that we have they do cost money and they are expensive yeah. uh, and you're right they should figure out how to do it cheaper well, especially because you know so many of the things i prescribe have been generic and have been for 25 30 years right. that shouldn't cost 50 bucks you know right, right. Exactly. you know it, that should cost six bucks and and it, I, I go a little nuts on this, you know, I'm on a blood pressure pill mm -hmm. and I, I go to my local pharmacy down in Stone Ridge, I'm not going to mention any names, and they give me a receipt that says, oh, it's only $17 copay, but this would have cost you 85 bucks. Look what a great job your insurance company's doing. Yeah, right. And I say, well, you know, I could pay $4 cash for this at Walmart and walk out with no <laughs> prescription <laughs> coverage. Or go well, up to Canada and get it cheaper. Right, for $2, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's. So we're going to have, next time you come on, you're going to have to, we got to give them an hour. <laughs> it's a lot to talk about. Man, you'll be sick of me in an hour, I got to tell you. <laughs> uh, 45 minutes. No. All right. <laughs> Dr. Ken Kircher, thank you so oh, much for pleasure. coming on. Uh, it's been a great uh, talk, and uh, I think you made some people think, right? Yeah. So. Well, thank you. You know, I, I you know, yeah. it sounds crazy, but I am kind of a fanatic about the skin. I just, I, thank God. It's so you, important. You're and, amazing. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. the invite. Yeah. Thank I, you for uh, the enthusiasm, really. So, yeah. all right, Dan, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Ken Kirshner, and thank you um, also, uh, Dr. Ed Alio, and of course, Tony Marmo for holding down the helm. Uh, you're with us here on Medical Monday, KCR at AM 920 and 92.5 FM, WGHQ. Monday, April 26th, and now uh, 41 degrees here in Uptown Kingston. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio was brought to you by Herzog's. And um, stop by Herzog's Home and Paint Center in the Kingston Plaza for all of your home building and maintenance and painting needs. And discover the difference of buying local, sales, or ongoing on their website at herzogs.com. Mid-Hudson Valley weather and forecast one more time. Uh, today it's going to be sunny, a high of 58, gorgeous day. Tonight, few passing clouds. To, and then Tuesday, cloudy skies early, then partly cloudy with a high of 67. Tuesday night, cloudy skies, 25% chance of a rain shower. And we'll be right back. Thanks for starting your day with Kingston Community Radio on 920 WGHQ AM Kingston and 92.5 W223CR FM Kingston, New York. Magic 92.5.
Thanks for starting your day with... Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. As the world faces the challenges of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Lions recognize that kindness matters now more than ever. And Lions and Leos are finding ways to continue to serve our communities. For more than 100 years, in times of need, Lions always find a way to help those around them. And after we emerge from this, we will be stronger than ever. Visit lionsclubs.org to learn more. Hi, this is Cameron Rylands from Kingston, and I support Kingston Community Radio because it's informative. Today's Monday, April 26th, and 41 degrees here in Uptown Kingston. You're with us on Kingston Community Radio, WGHQ 920 on your AM dial, 92.5 FM, and streaming online at mykcr.org. And 331-9255 is your call-in number. That's your number to call in to Tony Marmo and Dr. Ed Alio. And um, this upcoming portion of Kingston Community Radio is brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Many locations throughout the Mid-Hudson Valley, one near you. Let's get back to the on-air studio with Dr. Ed Alio and Tony Marmo. Welcome back. Okay, folks, welcome back. This has been a, a great show, Ed. Thank you. <clears throat> really. I mean, it's uh, very informative and topical. And uh, so now we're going to talk about your specialty, your area, uh, Dizzy Fizzy, <laughs> Dizzy Fix. So, you know, earlier we talked about the the orange, oranges of... of um, of uh, audiology and how things have changed over the years. So just give a little capsule of that in terms of what you've seen, and then and then you have a new toy toy here. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, um, audiology uh, is started probably, it, it's pretty new. It, mm-hmm. it was Second World War stuff. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they started out with... Uh, uh, talking about um, you know uh, airplanes and people in the airplane, and and they they were testing uh, people understanding. They use one syllable words or two syllable words, and they found out that uh, when you use a one syllable word, uh, people can't hear it. When you use a two syllable word, it's got more more information, mm-hmm. and if it was more vowel loaded, low frequency, they understood even more. Wow. If it was more high frequency. And, and more consonant loaded, they didn't understand. So if I said fin, F-I-N, and thin, people didn't get it. If they have a hearing loss, they even get less of it. Yeah. If you say upstairs, a lot more information. So they, so they learn from that, that that when you talk to people on the air, like you would do, Dan, but you got a roaring airplane, you can't be saying, okay, uh, it's uh, make sure your fin is up. I mean, what fin? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> See? yeah. And um, so uh, <laughs> it's very similar, very, very similar to how we misunderstand people on the phone. Yes. Because it's very, it's very band uh, centric. It's very, it's very band passed. Uh, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, limited. Limited in bandwidth, and so you you, you know uh, certain numbers and things like that are very hard to so tell. Or that's letters. that's what happened with hearing aids. So hearing aids had a very small bandwidth, mm-hmm. and they were analog. <clears throat> and as a result, you know you can hear from I don't know uh, two hundred hertz up to twenty thousand hertz. Okay, well that's a long that's a big bandwidth, mm-hmm. and the hearing aid can only go from like. Uh, uh, 750 or 1,000 hertz to 300, three, uh, uh, 13, 3,500 hertz. That's a, real, that's a real narrow bandwidth. So now they go lower, but you can't get it too low because that's too much low frequency, and that would mask the high. Low pitches mask, cover up high pitches. Well, high pitches don't cover up low pitches. 
if you think about if you think about that. So they've expanded it out to 8,000 hertz and more in the new stuff, and it's and it's more and no longer analog. Even though there are some analog items out there, it's all digital now. It's all processing, and they're so that has made it easier. Plus, you can stream from the hearing aid. You can um, you can pick up your phone, and your phone is the receiver, okay, and it sends the information to your hearing There's aid. A Bluetooth connection there. Bluetooth connection. Wow. And 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 in July, July, right now, coming in July, they're going to be able to uh, use the phone the same way, but now you can hear and you can talk through the hearing aid. You can talk. So if I call my brother right now, I say to him, I say, Joe, here's his hearing aid. Here's his, his phone over here. He's got his hearing aid. I say, okay. And I can hear his wife talking right next to him. I said, Joe, you're too close to your wife. He says, I can't hear her. <laughs> I said, well, that's because you have your hearing aid on. I'm talking to your hearing aid. I said, but your, your phone is the microphone. Yeah. So the microphone's feeding me. Yeah. So I said, so you have to, he couldn't get it. So I said, okay, walk into the kitchen and leave the phone in the kitchen and come back. And, he, and I said, now I can't hear your wife, but I can't hear you, you either, but you can hear me. He goes, oh, I got it. So now, in July, you're going to be able to do both. You're going to have the receiver mm -hmm. and the microphone so the guy can talk and hear and, and not hear through his... It, it'll be coming from the phone, but it won't be transmitting what's around the room. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, that's, that, so that stuff. And, and also, some of the stuff we do in dizziness, which is what we're going to talk about, I right. guess, a little bit, right. is you know, how are people dizzy? That's interesting. Uh, you know, when you say to people, and I, and I like dizziness in the sense of it, it's, it's another problem that nobody can see. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a hearing loss. You don't have much sympathy. If the guy's ear was bleeding, we'd be right. jumping all over it. Right. You can't hear, you must not be paying attention, right? Yeah, yeah. Selective yeah, yeah. hearing we yeah. talked about, which doesn't exist. Yeah. So with dizziness is the same thing. You don't have an appreciation for somebody who's dizzy. What's you're like, yeah. What's stop! That? Stop with telling me you're dizzy. I don't know. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and people Sit down, are, right? People are not sympathetic. So dizziness is uh, um, when they say they're dizzy. Uh, that's kind of like a garbage can term. We don't know what that means. So when you say you have vertigo, vertigo is a spinning thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. motion thing, mm -hmm. and the other one is lightheaded. Lightheaded is different than spinning. Mm -hmm. When you stand up. You bend over, you might be a little lightheaded. Everybody gets that. Uh, vertigo, I'm sure this doesn't happen to many people, but if you drink too much, mm -hmm. you get dizzy um, and you spin around. <clears throat> so that's, that's why a, you put your foot on the ground. <laughs> I mean, if you're, you, know, you nail two pegs into the yeah, floor. Right, right, onto right. Them. <laughs> that's an ear thing. Okay, that's a, a dizzy. Vertigo is an ear thing. Lightheaded is a head thing. Okay? Or. The brain. Mm -hmm. So you stay upright three ways. You stay upright with your eyes, mm -hmm. your ears, and your proprioception, where your body is in space, which is your cerebellar back here near your head. That's how you stay upright. So if any one of those three-legged stools are off, you fall over right. or you're not stable. Right. So that's pretty interesting when mm -hmm. you think about it. Um, and all, they all work together. So if you if you drink too much, for example, I'm sure nobody, not many. None of our listeners. Right. Yeah. So, but if you, and what, and what do drunks do when they're, when they're um, inebriated and drink too much? They close their eyes. Three-legged. Yeah. You close your eyes, and they fall over. Or they get sick. Mm -hmm. You get a vagal response. Because your ear is connected to your gut also, somehow. <laughs> See, and they get sick. So what they should do, which nobody does, because they're spinning, is look at something. Just stare right at your thumb or something. Sounds weird because you want to close your eyes. And it may help slow it down. But then again, because you drank too much, your whole body is affected, and so is your brain. <laughs> it's yeah. interesting. It's very. There's quite a parallel to seasickness. 
Yeah. Seasick. Because yeah. the worst thing you can do if you're seasick is go down into the cabin and sit there and close your eyes. Yeah. It's the worst thing. Yeah. The best thing to do is give them the tiller. Yeah. Give them a focus on the uh, on the horizon. Yeah. 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 That, uh, yeah. Seasickness is very you similar. You can see the horizon or yeah. stare right at the boat. Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. See, and yeah. again, what happens with the boat is <clears throat> two things. Again, proprioception. You're floating around. You don't have the sense of where your body is on the boat. Right. Yeah. And your ear is all. It's usually an ear thing, also, by the way. So it's an ear proprioceptive thing again. Mm -hmm. So uh, it makes it pretty interesting. Um, so, so what's your a, what's your uh, yeah toy? what's your little toy there? I'm well, curious. This this is it's like magic. It's hocus pocus. That's not really. It really works. There's a, there's a procedure called Epley, mm -hmm. E P L E Y. <laughs> it's a maneuver. It's an exercise. And um, um, and if anybody is well, I mean, this is how this is how the ear works. You know, you know how you get those globes for snow, like you know, at Christmas time, you turn them upside down, the snow falls down, mm -hmm. uh, something. Else. They're kind of cute. Well, picture your ear, your your semicircular canals mm -hmm. like that, and one of them is the one that's really the one that makes you dizzy. And, and so, when you turn it upside down, uh, or when it happens, is those little uh, Flakes. snowflakes. Yeah which are called otoliths, become loose. They become, they're dislodged from sitting down inside of the semicircular canal, and they're floating around. When they float and you move, you get dizzy. That's vertigo. So this Epley maneuver is a way to put somebody in a position, roll them over, and, and, and make them do that, and you kind of reset the otoliths. It sounds like magic, but it really works. The secret is, we used to make people do this, and they would get better, but then they would um, uh, do, do what made them dizzy. They would bend over, like, mm -hmm. when you bend over, that moves the other canal. <laughs> I mean, it makes the canal, you just, it just re-loosens re, re those autoliths again. So the secret is not to do that. You have to stay in a position. So if anybody's ever interested, they can call you guys or call me, and I, we would give them the Epley, and, and, and I have a great, I don't have it, but there's a great YouTube video by this uh, uh, therapist who who explains it really well and what you need to do. So I'll give him my phone number. Yeah, give your phone okay. number. And, and you can call me or text me, because uh, I usually don't answer if I don't recognize you, but I'll try for the next couple of days. 845-430-9080. Uh, 845-430-9080. Epley, E P L E Y, and I'll send you to the YouTube video. But can I ask about um, vertigo for a minute? Because I does it. I, I know, and it's more common than than you would think. I, a lot of folks, you know, I have a, a good friend out in Highland who's had it for a long time. And then another person said, "Oh yeah, I had vertigo too." Tr does it get treated um, uh, by uh, drugs, or is it uh, you know how typically how is vertigo treated? Well, that's interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. There's two ways of doing it. Um, and what, what vertigo, what vertigo does, we have a thing called central compensation. Um, you know, you're getting information from your ear that makes you dizzy. So your brain says, you got, so you have a weak vestibular system, balance system. Mm -hmm. So your brain says, make, simplified, uh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to take that information. And they kind of <laughs> right. receive it and you get, and, but you also get better just by doing exercise, walking, okay. whatever. It's kind of weird. What? Let's say you're in bed, you roll over on your right side and you get dizzy so people don't roll over. Right. That's a mistake. Right. <laughs> you right. got to roll over and keep your eyes open and you keep doing that. The first time you'll get dizzy, the second time you'll get less dizzy, third time you probably won't get dizzy at all. Mm. So that's called compensation. So people have it. The, the thing that so Nobody there's a physical. There's a physical fix, so to speak, or a, there's a there's a I mean, a yeah. exercise or this is the epilepsy the exercise. Okay. The other thing is to challenge your ear, okay. just by walking. You know, like I go to the gym and they got this this ball. It's a half ball. It's called a busa, B A S U or S. Mm -hmm. I forgot. Anyhow, it's a busa ball, and and it's supposed to be you know you get on it, but I turn it upside down. So the ball is on the bottom and the flat time. And it says, do not stand on this ball. So I'm telling everybody, it says, do not stand on the ball. <laughs> I stand on the ball. <laughs> okay. And I stand on it, and, you know, and, and it's going like bad. this. 
and your balance. So at, at first, my legs were like wobbly and you know I couldn't stand there. Now I can get on it, I step on it, I can walk in place, I can stand on one leg, I can switch legs. Mm -hmm. So my balance is getting better. That would be a great exercise. But you got to do it with holding on to a pole next yeah. to you, or you just can't get on this ball if you're dizzy because you'll fall off. So, yeah, you know, remember I said that you can't get on the ball, and the ball says don't get on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> but who listens? Who listens, right? Uh, so, um, but so typically, treatment not treated with drugs. Then Med oh, that's okay. what we're going to. Good. Okay. Not many people do this, and it's not really supported by a lot of um, a, a lot of science yet. Uh, but it's out there, and that is the first time you're dizzy, the first time you have this vertiginous episode. Sometimes, sometimes, you can be treated with prednisone and Valtrex. It's sort of like when you have a, 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 a sudden hearing loss from a virus. So we think that sometimes. People, we're not sure which people, um, have uh, vertigo. It could be uh, vestibular neuronitis from a virus. Mm -hmm. So you're not sure what it is. The results are the same. Uh, also could be a tumor. That's why you have to have a hearing test. Everybody who's dizzy should have a hearing test. I should say that. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if uh, your ears are different, you, it's, it's sort of like other parts of your body. What, if you have two of something, ears, eyes, whatever, um, you, um, uh, if, if one of them is off, that's not normal. And when you have swollen glands, it's both glands, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when you have uh, one ear that's got a big hearing loss and one is normal, that's not normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Usually your hearing loss stays the same. And that's a clue that we look for tumors then. Right, see? Right. Uh, it's called an acoustic neuroma. But for the vertiginous patient who goes to the hospital, the first thing the doc does is make sure you're not having a stroke or something, and they'll do a, a MRI. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and you don't. And ninety percent of the ninety-five percent of people don't have tumors. Okay, and then they give them um, um, antivert, mm -hmm. meclizine, which sedates them. So it doesn't solve the problem, makes them right. less dizzy. So the, the challenging it Thompson physically down. is what you need to do. And the other thing is you might put them, not many people do this, uh, you put them on prednisone because it might be the virus, and you put them on f uh, reducing dosage mm -hmm. along with Valtrax, which is an antiviral, um, and that helps. Now, those are not highly um, publicized, and not many people do them. Some mm -hmm. otologists do it. Uh, but um, so there is a treatment. Usually it's physical and you get better. Uh, but once, once somebody becomes vertiginous, there's a good chance that it will reoccur. That's, I was going to ask about recurrence. Yeah. yeah. And it's all about displacing those otoliths again. So drinking too much coffee. Getting, uh, getting, getting drunk. So there's triggers. Yeah, there's triggers. Uh, yeah, and, um, you, and another virus. You know, get sick. Your, right. Your immune system goes down, right. and it, uh, and they get weak again. So uh, metabolically, it can up. happen. Yeah, something like that. Interesting. Interesting. So it's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm saying it's fairly common. Vertigo is is fairly common. Uh, I mean, I don't know what you see in, have, in your practice. Have you seen a fair amount of that? Over time, we we test for it too. We we even yeah. have to, we even have tests for it. It's called uh, uh, ENG or VNG. Uh, it's a uh, um, it's it's a test that where we can uh, 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 check their vestibular systems, mm -hmm. and we can put them in positions. We put electrodes on them. We can see which ear is the weak ear, and there's a pretty simple clinical test you can do too, uh, to to evaluate initially what you think which ear you think is the the weak ear mm -hmm. or the weak vestibular system. So it's, it's uh, fairly yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, it is, it is. Um, uh, let's, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Dr. Alio. It's 3319255. Someone might have, uh, you know, uh, a thought about, hey, you know, whatever, whatever's going on, maybe, maybe occupational, maybe uh, something else that you've been dealing with and thinking, geez, I, I need to get this checked out, and please please give a call, 331-9255. Um, so, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, 
The thing I have here is um, something I picked up at, at, at a uh, otology, um, otolaryngology um, meeting a, a number of years ago. And it's called Dizzy Fix. And it's kind of, like I said, it's a kind of apparatus, weird. huh? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of strange looking, but, yeah. but it, it mocks, it, it, it follows the, uh, and I've given it to people and it works. Yeah. It doesn't look like it works, but look at this. And, and you take this thing, and we, it's, it's, a, it's a hat, and, it, and, it, and it, I know you're laughing because it looks funny. Well, well the hat is, uh, does the hat go with the deal? No. Yeah, the hat's free. No, the hat goes <laughs> the deal. Okay. See how it goes like this? Oh, yeah. And those are the semicircular canals. And when you move the little otoliths to your right and left, wow. and there's there's little otoliths inside here that okay. move, and you as you move in position, they move. Okay. Okay. So it's it's pretty interesting, um, and uh, okay. it, it works. But the video is even better. The All video right. that I have is even better. Dizzy fix. I'm Dizzy sure fix. if you uh, yeah. uh, Google that. So yeah. so the uh, the apparatus there is actually showing you what the what to do what 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 your uh, semicircular yeah. canals yeah. are doing. Yeah, and that's really cool. Oh it's wow! So it's a, it's, it it's follows a that little of it. otolith around. Yep. And you get the correct ear because you're not sure which ear it is, so people can't tell. So when you do the Epley. You know which ear it is, and this one also tells you which ear because they're not sure. So when you get into the position, and you get and you don't if you don't get dizzy, that's not the ear. You get in the position that makes you dizzy. That's the ear that's weaker, and then you go through the maneuver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyhow, it's a uh, 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 it's a good visual thing. The otolith is down here. Here it comes. See it moving? Oh yeah. See? Oh yeah, here it goes. Cool. And, and it moves well, around. Yeah, yeah. In position. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Looks, it's a. Uh, it is a interesting. cool little trick. Uh, so what about, um, I know we only have a few minutes left, but uh, another common issue is uh, people generate a lot of earwax. Oh, yeah, earwax. <laughs> earwax. <laughs> I, you know, and, and, that, and that's... My, my least favorite topic that I'll tell you about. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> because people are really... Um, earwax is a phenomena that occurs by you... Um, Trying to get it out of your ear. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually in, it's usually induced you're, you're by the individual. Jamming it in by a Q-tip. Yeah, Q-tips. If you ever looked at a Q-tip, uh, what how it's advertised, it never mentions your ear. It never <laughs> mentions your ear. It's to you polish know. little tight areas. If you can't get in there with anything else, no. Go ahead. So the, the Q-tip is a plunger. Yeah. Okay. There's your ear. Yeah. There's the Q-tip. Yeah. The, you're just the wax jamming the wax in your in ear. There. It doesn't hook and come out. We have hooks. We yeah. have loops. We take it out. Yeah. You Q-tip pushes it in. So here's how your ear works real quick. Your ear, um, the keratin that he talked about, yeah. you know, those cells, uh, uh, skin, it sloughs off. And it built, it's in your ear. And it migrates out. You ever go like this and you get wax in your ear? You touch yeah. it and it, it comes out on its own. Leave it alone. It'll come home. <laughs> Wagging his tail behind him. You know, <laughs> leave it alone. Um, in the, uh, but when you put the Q-tip in, it forces it in. Let's say in, in your ears always has this oil, which right. becomes the wax, and you push it in. So now you've got this round circle of a, a dam. And as you keep pushing it in, you build the dam higher and higher. Right. And now it's, the, it's there. It's not in your ear. Besides that, you're going like this because your ear itches. So when your ear is dry, it itches. Yeah. And they stick the Q-tip in. Yeah. And yeah, they yeah. wipe out the wa the oil. And certain canals are narrow, right? Certain canals are narrower than others. And the, and you put the old Q-tip in there, it just kind of blocks it all up. The Q-tip <laughs> blocks them all. I mean, I, I have patients where they this guy had this big wad of, of, of cotton in his ear because he yeah. put the Q-tip in. And if you look at the Q-tip, it, it's co clockwise or counter. Yeah. And he'd go like this around and he'd unravel the, the, <laughs> the cotton. <laughs> so I pulled this cotton out. It was like this big out of his ear. And, and the guy couldn't, said, he couldn't oh, hear. yeah, I can hear now. <laughs> they do. They got, can hear. But the uh, interesting thing is, so Q-tips cause the wax problem um, yeah. and they dry out the ear and you need to leave them alone. Yeah. Um, and and there's a ton of products for that. On the, if you look anywhere, right on the internet, but there's a million earwax removal things, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's yeah. a zillion dollar industry, probably. But not all of them are the right things to do yeah. either. So you the best thing to go, do is call your audiologist. Call your audiologist. Yeah. Go to your doctor, an ENT, and right. we'll, we'll ta they'll take it out. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's the best thing to and do. And stop using the Q-tip. Yeah, yeah. Which is hard to do because people are addicted to that. Right. They're, They're good always, for like you know model building or you know trying I, to you I know probably, get into very tight areas yeah, for makeup. Probably, and, yeah. I probably have this cleaning electronic equipment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I probably had this discussion a million times with patients. And I can look in their ear. If your ear canal is shiny looking yeah. and dry, I know they use Q-tips. Yeah. Then I can see that ring around their ear, and I know they use Q-tips. <laughs> so it's uh, All right. All of you Q-tip users. <laughs> beware. <laughs> Cease and desist. Uh, but it, it, won't hap- it won't happen. This has been great, Ed. Thank, thank you, thank you thank so you. much for coming on, and, and uh, look forward to next month. and. Yep. Uh, we have some new guests. I think Dr. Uh, Kircher, Ken Kircher, is going to come, come back. back. And we're having uh, uh, Dr. Parker, Walter Parker. Great, He's great, a great. urologist. He's yep. coming. Thanks to and Dr. It'll, Tack it'll for coming on. And uh, it was a great show. Great first show, my Thank friend. You. Thank you. Appreciate excellent, it. excellent. All right, everyone, be safe out there. Be careful. Be safe. Uh, help those less fortunate than you are. Figure it out, folks. Right? You're not an island. We're all in this together. All right. Take care, Dan. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Allo. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Uh, Dr. Alio. And um, thank you, listeners, for uh, being with us today. This last portion of Kingston Community Radio has been brought to you by Ulster Savings Bank. Many locations throughout the Mid-Hudson Valley, one near you. Thank you for sharing the morning with us and participating in Kingston Community Radio, KCR, AM 920 and 92.5 FM WGHQ, and our live streaming on mykcr.org. And we air from 7 to 9 a.m. every weekday. And until tomorrow, for Terrific Tuesdays, we wish you every success in growing and developing Kingston and all our neighboring communities. We now return you to Magic 92.5. Ask me, am I?